Te na koto, te whanau o Auckland Unitarian. Te na koto ngā manuhiri, manuhiri. nau mai haere mai. Ki tenei, ki tenei ai, whare karakia o te atua. Te na koto, te na tato, katoa. Good morning, everyone. My name's John DeLeo, and this morning Clay has asked me to lead our worship. At this time, I, uh, we welcome you all into this space, which was, has been made sacred by Auckland Unitarians for 118 years. Before we begin this morning, I would, of course, like to remind everyone that you are, we are all invited to morning tea immediately following the service. It is our sacrament of hospitality. Please be sure to join us. It just won't be the same without you. We are about to enter sacred time. We are about to make this time and this place sacred by our presence and intention. Please turn off or silence your phones. And as you do so, I invite us also to turn down the volume on our fears, to remove our masks, and to loosen the armor around our hearts. Don't take my word for it. Do it as slowly as you need to. If you take a little risk with all these good people, you may find that they have the same human needs as you do. Breathe. Let go of the expectations placed on you by others and those they taught you to place on yourself. Drop the guilt and the shame, not to shirk accountability, but in honest expectation of the possibility of forgiveness. Let go of the thing you said the other day. Let go of the thing you dread next week. Be here in this moment. Breathe here. For my opening words today, I've selected a passage from a fairly well-known book, uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 22. This story of Abraham and Isaac provides an example of the emphasis on sacrifice in many traditions. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for, for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. We light our chalice this morning. Grateful for the love that we experience in this beloved community. May the flame light the way for all who seek such abundance.
Before I begin my actual talk, I want to give you just a brief rundown of my history with regard to religion and church. Although my parents were both active in their respective churches as children and teens, they remained largely unchurched after they married. And they really never did much to encourage my siblings or me in that regard. I would occasionally go to church with various relatives, but really didn't have any sort of a religious upbringing. I started attending a local Episcopal church where one of my older sisters had become active when I was 10. I jumped in with both feet. I became an active acolyte, was confirmed at 13, eventually served on a parish vestry, and I even briefly considered pursuing ordination. Briefly. <laughs> All this, along with my first marriage, came to an abrupt end in 1994, when my wife took her role as choir mistress a little bit too literally and left me for the organist. I wish that weren't a true story. For the next 14 years, I really wasn't the church-going sort. I briefly attended a UU congregation in Clemson, South Carolina while we were living there, but it didn't really take that time. I met Tess in 1997 and we married in 99. Tess was born in Utah and had been a lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you know, the Mormons. I decided to join that church in 2008 and remained active there for several years. Not long after joining that church, I was called as a ward mission leader. And I spent over a year teaching the RE class for prospective and new members. And now I'm here. The title of my talk this morning is inspired by another passage from the Christian Bible. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't really have a sermon to deliver, and I really don't think I have any great wisdom to impart. Instead, I wanted to bring up some things that have always made me wonder and gave me trouble as I learned these things and I read and heard and watched over the years. And then after I do tell you these thoughts I have, then I'm really interested to hear yours, so I'll open the floor for some discussion as time permits. One of Clay's recent sermons where he talked about Easter and Lent got me thinking about the prominence of sacrifice in the Easter story and in many of the traditional Christian observances, especially around Lent. Sacrifice is depicted throughout Judeo-Christian scripture as a redemptive act. In the Old Testament, a penitent man seeking redemption was required to perform a ceremonial blood sacrifice, a burnt offering. The animal sacrificed had to be very dear, firstlings of the flock, young males without blemish, and had to be completely used up, fully burnt in the process. In other words, there had to be a real cost. In the Easter story, we hear of Jesus, the Christ, God made flesh, accepting ridicule, torture, and an agonizing death on the Calvary cross. This sacrifice according to the Gospels, is really his raison d'etre. He came to the earth to do that because it's what his father deemed necessary and sufficient for mankind to gain resurrection and eternal life. So there's a lot of focus on that sacrifice, on the suffering and the price paid through it. When I joined the LDS church, I was really intrigued the first time I was there for Easter to learn that the focus isn't on the cross, and really it's not even on resurrection. The most important moment in LDS doctrine is when Jesus is praying at the Garden at Gethsemane just before his arrest and decides to go through with it. It's that decision, which is called in the LDS church, the act of atonement, that's what really mattered. 
So all of that got me thinking about, wow, this sacrifice is a pretty big deal. Now, aside from the Passion and the Easter story, Judeo-Christian scriptures contain lots of stories of great sacrifice, probably most notably the story of Abraham and Isaac that I quoted from earlier. A lot of the customs around Lent that Clay also alluded to in his earlier sermon require the faithful to perform smaller acts of sacrifice through self-denial. Traditions might call on us to fast on certain days, to abstain from eating meat or consuming rich foods, or to give up something we particularly enjoy. Now, where I grew up, it was a French Roman Catholic town in the middle of Connecticut. Kind of an odd combination. So one of the, a really common conversation on the bus, usually on Shrove Tuesday or Ash Wednesday would be, so what are you giving up for Lent? That was part of what even children were being taught to do. Think about what to give up. Make that sacrifice for the six weeks of Lent. I chose to read The Giving Tree during Time for All Ages because of its depiction of selfless sacrifice, even unto destruction. When asked what the moral of the story is, I mentioned this before, people can respond very differently. Some focus on the unconditional love shown by the tree, often thought to represent that of parents for their children. And in that context, the boy is seen to represent the world's ungrateful children who take their parents' sacrifices and their resulting suffering for granted. Now, hearkening back to the scripture referenced in my title, in many mainstream churches, perhaps not coincidentally, in many of those that enjoy the status of state religion in some parts of the world, there are recurring calls to sacrifice earthly pleasures or comforts, or maybe more correctly, to forgo seeking them or complaining about not having them in the hope of obtaining some future reward, either in this life or in the next. In the secular world, especially in times of crisis, the people are called on to make sacrifices for the greater good. These calls, oddly enough, are frequently made by wealthy political leaders who never seem to feel that pain quite so acutely. Lately, we've seen a resurgence of populist and patriotic rhetoric in political discourse. We have many politicians around the world, including, of course, Donald Trump, calling on the people of their nations to make sacrifices to further various agendas. One, when I did a Google search talking about sacrifice for political gain, of course, one that came up was the trade war with China between that Donald Trump instigated and how he was stumping talking about the patriotic sacrifices being made by farmers because, of course, the trade war was causing catastrophic financial harm to farmers, large and small. And I th always thought that was kind of ironic because that it wasn't exactly a willing sacrifice. They thought things were going to be just fine until he decided to spur on this war. And that's where my thinking on this subject obviously took a dark turn. Gave rise to a lot of cynicism and a lot of worry. This central role played by sacrifice in so many religions, does it serve to condition their followers so they'll blithely accept calls for more of the same, say in the name of patriotism or nationalism? Was that the purpose from the very beginning? And if that's the case, how do we counter that? Especially if we don't want to descend into religious warfare. So, now that I've made everybody feel terrible, now that we've followed my thoughts into this morass of worrying questions, I think it'd be interesting to open up the floor to discussion. I'd just like to comment that, um, or to open that out to a broader global perspective. For example, uh, visiting the Andes a few years ago, I was fascinated to discover the 
the pattern of sacrifice. And I think I saw the mummified head of a young girl that had been sacrificed because the people there thought that might stop the gods having thunderstorms. And, and it's kind of like, uh, and let me think, the suicide bombers strike me as another one. Um, Ramadan strikes me as another one where people are asked to sacrifice a lot. So I do think this is um, it's very much a global issue, if you like. But it doesn't add much to the conversation except to say it's everywhere. My thoughts about Abraham, and I'm just, just going to throw this out there, and you don't have to, have to agree or not agree, was that Abraham thought, because of his background and because of where he had come from and the worship that he had experienced in his past, that a child, sacrificing your child is the thing you love the most, was the thing that he should give. And he put that in the way of his... Um, of what God would want of him. If God had wanted that of him, he wouldn't have changed his mind, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is, why would he have provided the ram if he had intended the child to die? So to me, it says that Abraham actually got this story just a bit twisted in his mind. This was something from the human condition, not from God. So, and that's where my battle with the Baptist church began. <laughs> I agree. That story really is challenging because he was being, as the scripture says, he was being deliberately tested. That basically God had no intention of actually making him sacrifice his son, who, by the way, if I remember the scripture correctly, they had had a very, very hard time conceiving, and they really weren't expecting to have more children. So this is kind of a big deal. Um, but what you saw was it was really just that, that horrible psychological test of are you willing to do it? As I said before, I come from an atheist tradition. And it's profoundly disturbing and I'm no less disturbed as a result of this uh, conversation. Just following up, um, David where you sort of externalise sacrifice, political sacrifices. In our country, World War I and the massive slaughter that we were engaged in, um, that, that, was, uh, that was us. That could still happen again. It happened in World War II, where we had, I think, the highest percentage of men overseas in service of any country. Um, we have the bizarre, um, well, some reference... I think, and yours, John, to a Trump and a trade war with China. We had the bizarre situation of Winston Peters with massive parliamentary pension and everything else, all the way with LBJ in terms of America. Our living standards and life we enjoy depends on our trade with China. Winston Peters is seemingly willing to sacrifice that uh, to get in with Washington. So it's not just overseas. It's not just other... Um, you know, people that we see rather alien. We, this is embedded in our culture. Honestly, I, I, I knew that this was going to be a little bit of a difficult conversation, but it's, it's one that I've had in my head for a long time. Having, having moved into, you know, Episcopal and, and Christian tradition and, and then even with the different perspective in the LDS church, I was always thinking, but, but this doesn't make any sense. And then when I started thinking at it, about it more cynically, it started to make sense, and that really sucked. And when I was asked to, to lead the worship, and I was trying to think of, well, what do I want to talk about? This was niggling at me. After Clay's sermon a few weeks ago, it came back to the front, and I was like, this is really bothering me. Let's talk about it. <laughs> My name is Jared, and this is the first time I've spoken to this church. Um, look, I hope I understand your question, but I think you're speaking about... I have other things on my mind. Um, you're speaking about the sacrifice. Um, it's often perplexed me why Christians believe in the sacrifice and place so much importance on it. I think Jesus Christ at the time was, spoke, was possibly speaking to Jews at the time, and he was speaking in a language that they understand. Jesus Christ would have known that you don't need a sacrifice to enter the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven is already within, isn't it? 
The kingdom of heaven is already within us. And you hear it every day. People say, you only live once. And I say under my breath, yes, but it's for a very long time. A couple of years ago, I was at the um, uh, at a service at the Jewish um, Liberal Synagogue uh, in Manukau Road, and they had this very lesson came up. And um, when I was being welcomed at the door, um, a person came up to me and, and warned me about the topic. And he says, "Don't take this story literally. Uh, Abraham <laughs> Abraham was a man of his time, and he got it wrong." Um, and um, and that I, that's what I think. I think the, the idea of sacrifice is a, um, an idea with a small amount of merit that some religions go way over the top about. And to me, there is sacrifice that's needed in life. Uh, one would be that we need to sacrifice our comfort if we are to prevent um, global warming wrecking the place. Um, and, people, uh, and it's a very real issue. Um, and that our sacrifices should be um, aimed at increasing... Um, the welfare of the planet, not, not at um, pleasing some angry God. Yeah, the Isaac story. Um, I, th I think the lesson for me is that ultimately he didn't have to sacrifice his child. Um, even though what, what he was being asked to do was something out of his tradition, um, like based in his tradition, even though sacrificing his child was a sort of extreme um, manifestation of that. But in the end, God said, no, you don't actually need to do that. What's important is that you're, um, you're giving to me. You know, and now that I know you're happy to do that, you know, sort of no problem kind of thing. Um, and the, the giving tree story, yeah, the, you know, the tree was happy, uh, giving and happy, the child was taking and, and not happy and always wanting something else. Um, but yeah, it's like one way that story can be taken is, you know, be a total doormat and that's not a, that's not a good way to, uh, to interpret it. I'm intrigued by the different takes on the giving tree, but the thought that I'm reminded of is sacrifice is about control. It's about trying to have power over that which you have no control. Uh, you know, in the earliest times, there were and it talks about this uh, Isaac, uh, Abraham's story. You know, it was proof of Abraham's fear of God. Okay, so people would make sacrifice to try and control the thunder or the drought or whatever. It was a whole. It was seen as a way of controlling uh, that around them. Uh, Sacrificing our young people at war is about power and control uh, to run off the, those we fear. Uh, so that's, that's definitely the downside of what sacrifice is about. And it's not about something that's going on internally, but about something where we're trying to uh, manage a world rather than manage ourselves. Oh, by the way, your reference to the LDS, I, I, uh, I learned this recently. The other branch of who we are as Unitarians is Universalists. And Joseph Smith, who founded the uh, Mormons, Grew up as a universalist. So he's probably part of the family tree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 
Now, to sum up, and I, I thank you, a lot of your comments have actually helped me. You know, David, you pointed out that there are some things that we recognize need to happen and that we know will require that we be willing to make sacrifices. What the concern that came to mind for me is, if you think about how a lot of this is built into so many religious traditions and the indoctrination, that sacrifice becomes a trigger word. That, oh, they're asking me to make a sacrifice. I have to do that. And, and how that gets manipulated by those who have the power and control. That that's what I'm concerned and wondering what we can really do about. And I'm sorry I didn't come here with answers. I came here with questions and, and thank you for helping me come up with more questions. Some came here today to be blessed with answers in a tumultuous world. Let us hope, too, however, that many of us have been blessed with questions to direct us with a clarity of mind to steer our logic towards kindness and justice always. <laughs>